This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace and peace to you on this Lord's Day. We are happy that you are worshiping with us here at Norwood First Presbyterian Church. And while we long to be physically together, I am grateful for the technology that allows us to worship together in spirit, even when we are scattered. Boys and girls, I want you to run and get your story Bible books that the church gave you this summer. Remember, they're blue and they're called Growing in God's Grace. I think that you will want that during the service. A word about our music. When you see a group of people in the sanctuary singing as you did last week, please know that that is a recording from this summer. We are not bringing folks together um, in the sanctuary while the numbers um, of COVID in our area are so high. And also for those of you who are visitors um, to our church, those that are sitting close to one another are all in one family. I do want to thank all of our musicians who have helped to uh, bring music to these virtual services, and I hope I will not leave anyone out. David, Wayne, Charles, Lucy, Hallie, Mitchell, Stephen, Tiffany, Mason, Rex, and of course, our music leader, Sonny. We are blessed to have many talented musicians, and I thank them once again for sharing their gifts with us. On Tuesday at seven o'clock, we will begin a Bible study that focuses on lament, specifically finding hope in prayers of grief and lament. I know this is a change from what I had originally um, announced, but it feels like something that we need right now. We will begin by looking at Psalm 22 and Matthew's account of Jesus on the cross. I will send out a Zoom link on Monday. It would be helpful to me if you will let me know if you plan to participate. Friends, on Thursday night, John Miller joined the church triumphant. And our love and prayers go to Mary Boyd, Chris, and his family, the Edwards clan, and all of those who loved and knew John. And as we hold them in our prayers, we also hold on to the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. We gather as a body for worship in this time of grief, with concern about our nation, anxiety about the pandemic and the physical and economic toll that is taking on our country. And, and for some of us with personal struggles that others may not know anything about. Thanks be to God, we also come to worship, to worship a God who is gracious and loving and who promises never to forsake us. Let us turn now our focus to this God. Hear these words from Psalm 62. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Let us pray. Eternal God, the refuge and help of all your children, we praise you for all you have given us, for all you have done for us, for all that you are to us. In our weakness, you are strength. 
In our darkness, you are light. In our sorrow, you are comfort and peace. You are our only hope. For you alone, our souls wait in silence. We give thanks for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In him, we have received grace upon grace. Yet we confess that we often do not want to see that same grace extended to others. Like Jonah of old, we would rather proclaim death and destruction to our enemies than see them forgiven and redeemed. Forgive our hardness of heart, O God, and our reluctance to see your divine image in those who hate and despise us, and in those with whom we vehemently disagree, and yes, sometimes find ourselves hating. Like Jonah, we also know that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. We know you are a God of second chances and transformation. And so we pray, teach us to love our enemies, that our lives may proclaim your truth, that love is stronger than hate and mercy is greater than vengeance. We ask this in the name of the Prince of Peace. Amen. and girls, young and old. Today, in the time for the sermon, I am going to tell an old, old story. Now, Jesus is not in this story, but it is a story about God's love. I'm going to tell the story of Jonah, and you'll remember that he's the one that got swallowed by the big fish. Like Samuel last week, Jonah was called by God to speak words from God to God's people. Now, Jonah is no hero in this story. He bumbles along. He tries to flee from God. He forgets to pray. And when he does do the right thing by going where God told him to do and saying the words God told him to say, he does it in the wrong way. He gets angry with God. 
So Jonah is certainly not a hero. Lots of people say that the story of Jonah is told because he's a lot like you and me. And perhaps you will find yourself in the story of Jonah. I certainly can find myself. But of course, it's not just a story about Jonah. This is a story about God. God keeps pursuing Jonah, never forcing Jonah to obey, but he keeps pursuing him in love. And in this story, we find a God whose amazing grace and mercy and love is beyond human imagining. In many ways, this story of Jonah is like the parables or some of the parables that Jesus tells. It is designed to help us find our place in the story and also tease us into a greater understanding of God. Now, boys and girls, in your Bibles, um, you will find this story starts on page 132, and you may want to follow along with it. But let us first pray for God's illumination. Let us pray. Gracious God, your word surprises, challenges, upsets, and overturns our way of seeing and thinking. By the power of your Holy Spirit, cause that which is withering in us to blossom until we see as you see. Amen. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, because their wickedness has made, been made known to me. Now Jonah responded to God's call, all right, but he went in the exact opposite direction. Jonah hopped on a ship to Tarshish, thinking that he could get away from the presence of the Lord. Now, there's good reason why Jonah would think that Nineveh was not a good place to be sent. It was, after all, the capital of Israel's oppressor. It was public enemy number one. But escaping God's presence is not that easy. After Jonah was on the ship and they were out to sea, God hurled a great wind and a storm came up and the waves crashed over the boat, threatening to sink it. Well, the sailors were worried. Now they didn't worship Israel's God, but they cried out to their own gods for help. They tossed cargo off the ship to lighten the load, but nothing helped. Everyone was praying except Jonah. And where was Jonah? He was under deck asleep. The captain found him and woke him up and said, get up and pray to your God. Maybe he can help. Now the sailors figured out that it was Jonah who was causing the storm. They cast lots and determined that it was Jonah who was the problem. And they sensed that he was running away from God and that scared them. When all of their other options failed and at the insistence of Jonah himself, the sailors threw Jonah overboard into the sea. The storm quieted down and the sailors were safe at last. But Jonah was in a heap of trouble. Or at least he would have been had God not appointed this great big fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. It was there in the dark, dank, confined spaces with the circumstances of his life overwhelming him that Jonah finally understood. Jonah finally came face to face with the fact that he was not in control of his destiny or his destination. 
in the belly of the fish, now in the depths of despair, Jonah finally turned to God in prayer. You probably remember what happened next. The Lord spoke to the fish, and the fish vomited Jonah out onto dry land. But God wasn't through with Jonah. Jonah still had a mission. God was still at work within and around Jonah's ineptness, unwillingness, God was still going to accomplish his purposes. Now, boys and girls, the second part of this story begins on page 134 in your Bibles, and it's called A Second Chance for Jonah. So the second half of this story begins just like the first did. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to Nineveh. This time, Jonah goes. Now, Nineveh was really a great city. It was very large. It would take three days to walk across it. And Jonah went to Nineveh, and he began crying out, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Just one day's walk into Nineveh, the people believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth, which is a sign of repentance. When the news finally made it to the king, he seems to be one of the last to have heard Jonah's announcement, he ordered everyone to fast and be covered in sackcloth and did so himself. And he had ordered them to cry out mightily to God. Even the animals were to fast and be covered in sackcloth. The king ordered them to turn from their evil and violent ways. For who knows, he said, God may change his mind and quit being angry with us, and let us live. And of course, as you know, that is just what happened. Scripture says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Now, one would assume that Jonah would be ecstatic about this. Think about this. An eight-word sermon, and everyone listened, and not only that, the whole city changes its ways. But of course, Jonah was not pleased. Jonah, in fact, was angry. And in that anger, he reveals why he tried to flee from God in the first place. You see, it seems that Jonah knows more about God than he makes out. He knew that God is gracious and merciful. And as Eugene Peterson paraphrases it, ready to at the drop of a hat to turn plans for punishment into a program for forgiveness. Jonah wants no part of that, at least as it pertains to his evil enemies, the Ninevites. When God relented on destroying Nineveh, Jonah prayed to the Lord, saying this, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, 
please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah finds God's forbearance and compassion, God's amazing grace, just too much to handle. It is too scandalous for him. After all, the Ninevites were such evil people. The Lord asks Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? As if to say, now, Stop and think about this. For you see, it hasn't crossed Jonah's mind that when he directly disobeyed God, when he directly disobeyed God's command, headed in the exact opposite direction of where God told him to go, still God pursued him with persistent love. It doesn't seem to cross Jonah's mind that if God were not a merciful God, he would have let him drown in the sea. It is so easy to miss how we have been the recipients of God's grace when we see others whom we feel are undeserving. Jonah could have allowed himself to be surprised by grace as he was in the belly of the fish when he prayed, I called to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Instead, Jonah is angry. He cannot abide God's mercy toward his sworn enemy. Anger is a sure sign that something is wrong. But anger doesn't tell us if the wrong is outside or inside us. Jonah can't give up on the possibility that Nineveh might be destroyed. And so he walked out of the city and put together a makeshift shelter. And he sat there to wait, it, wait to see what really would happen to that great city. But God does not give up on Jonah. The Lord arranged for a large leafy bush to come up over Jonah and to give him shade. And Jonah was really happy about that. But the next morning at dawn, God sent a worm to the bush, he began boring into that bush, and the bush withered. The day was hot, and the sun beat down on Jonah, and he was angry. And in anger, he cried out, it is better for me to die than to live. It's interesting. First, Jonah is angry at God's provision of mercy and protection to the Ninevites. And now he's angry because God takes away God's provision of protection in the form of a bush for him. God still doesn't give up on Jonah and neither does he force his hand he merely guides Jonah by asking questions. God says, said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And Jonah said, yes, enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? 
And that's where the story of Jonah ends, with that question. In the end, God does not mention the repentance of the Ninevites as the reason that he showed mercy toward them. Rather, what is stressed is God's unconditional love. Unconditional love for people who do not know their right hand from their left. And don't forget the animals. Jonah reluctantly went to preach to the Ninevites. But in the end, it is the experience, their experience of God, that became a sermon for him. A sermon about God's amazing grace. As Eugene Peterson writes, Jonah's sulking over God's mercy toward the Ninevites came from a, a failure of imagination as well as a failure of heart. He knew little of the heights of God's love, the depths of God's mercy, and the breadth of his salvation. Jonah's plan was an accusatory finger pressed against the chest of the city, hoping for destruction. God's plan was a father's embrace of the city, hoping for salvation. Did Jonah eventually rejoice at the magnitude of God's grace and favor? We don't know. And I don't know if you found yourself in this story of Jonah, running from God and God's call, praying only in desperation, unable to pray for, rejoice with, even hope for God's mercy, grace, love, and protection to fall upon those whom you perceive as enemies. Jonah was blind to his common plight, the humanity that he shared with the Ninevites. He was blinded to all of that by his hatred of them. In a recent opinion piece in the New York Times, Columnist David Brooks asserts that in recent years, we didn't disagree more about policy or norms or vision than in times past. We just hated each other more. We didn't disagree more. We just hated each other more. Now, you may agree with this, you may not. If it's true, and there seems to be some evidence to think that there might be, that it might be true, we've got a spiritual problem in our nation and a spiritual problem of a different nature than those that are often proclaimed by our evangelical brothers and sisters. It is a problem that the story of Jonah and the story of, a God, of God's amazing grace can and will speak into if we open our hearts to hear it. Amen. Oh, oh, oh.
Almighty and loving God, amazing is your grace that comes to us not once, not twice, but continually, day in and day out, year in and year out, undeserved, unmerited, often unacknowledged by us. Your overflowing love and graciousness toward us is beyond our imagining. Lord, may your grace shape us, shape our lives so that we might be half as generous toward others as you are to us. God of the nations, we give you thanks that peace prevailed in our nation this week and that we were privileged to once again witness the peaceful transfer of power in the halls of government. Send your spirit to sweep across this broken, unfinished land we call home to restore community among us, not a community of uniformity, but a community in which we talk through our differences with respect and all seek the common good. We pray for President Biden as he begins his administration. We pray for protection, for wisdom, and for success in ways that will be pleasing in your sight. May he, Vice President Harris, and all elected officials govern in ways that put people over politics. Grant wise discernment among all our elected leaders as they grapple with enormous challenges in order to bring health, healing, peace, and justice to our land. God of boundless mercy and hope, like the people of Nineveh putting on sackcloth and praying for kindness, we look to you for solace, for comfort, for help when life is too much. We pray for the people who have lost jobs as a result of this pandemic and who wonder how they will make ends meet. We pray for our children and teens who at such a young age are living through so many once in a lifetime experiences and not the good kind. May we be good stewards of their lives, remembering that they are watching what we say 
and what we do during these challenging times. We pray for those who suffer from illness and pain, for those who suffer from heartache and grief, for those whose needs we do not even know. Today, we pray especially for Mary Boyd, Chris, and all their family as they mourn the death of John. Uphold them through their hope in you and grant them the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, we pray for our enemies and we pray for our friends. And as always, we pray for those who work on the front lines of this pandemic. We offer all our prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Support the weak. Help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessings of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit abide with you this day and always. Amen. May the God of hope go with us every day, filling all our lives with joy and love and peace. May the God of justice feed us on our way, bringing light and hope to every land and race. Praying, let us work for peace. Singing, share our joy with all. Working for a world that's new, faithful, when we hear Christ call.